advanced canola trait technology is here. And it's soon to be the talk of the town. Optimum Glide delivers excellent yield potential and agronomic trait performance. Improved crop safety. Enhanced weed control. And a wider window of application. You're going to want to see this. Learn more at OptimumGlide.ca. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and RealAgriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Thursday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much, everybody, for making Real Ag Radio and, of course, Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. Also, a big shout out to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. Of wherever you get your podcast, tell your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, anybody that's interested in agriculture, make sure they check out. Real Ag Radio. Okay, broadcasting today from uh, Memphis, Tennessee. We'll have more on that tomorrow on the show. Of course, we did a Real Ag Issues panel yesterday, and tomorrow uh, we got a special treat from a big field day down here in Memphis. We'll get to that uh, tomorrow. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Okay, today it is the Farmer Rapid Fire. No changes today on the schedule. We are doing what we usually do today, and it is, of course, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. For more than 90 years, Pioneer has developed and tested products to meet your local challenges with new Optimum Glide Canola, Enlist D3 soybeans to performing corn products, and industry-leading traits and technologies to maximize your yield potential. Pioneer's on-the-ground teams can help you get the right products for your fields. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. Great to have Pioneer Seeds as the exclusive sponsors, exclusive sponsor here of the Farmer Rapid Fire. And speaking of Farmer Rapid Fire, we are, uh, we've got a great list of people. Uh, now, one new person as well, which is I'm going to get to in a second. So we've got Mark Burnham. He's from Coburg, Ontario. Ryan Barrett's in PEI on Prince Edward Island. We've got Jeff Elder, who's in Wawanisa, Manitoba. And a newcomer to the Farmer Rapid Fire is going to be Colin DeMozak, who will join us today from Bigger, Saskatchewan. Our pioneer agronomist today is Chris Olback, who is out in Ontario. So we've got a great list. We've got gr- lots of conditions. And I'm looking forward to hearing what exactly is going on in some of these fields and how are people progressing and how they're making out with some of the heat and some of the, the weather challenges that we've had. We, we, we've had a lot of water, a lot of rain in some parts of uh, Central Canada, yeah, it's it's been it's been pretty brutal to be honest. Is the more I talk to people, but uh, we still got a crop out there for sure, and I, we're gonna get we're gonna have some sh- light shed here on how things are looking. Now, out in Western Canada, we continue to hear that cereals are the crop that looks the best. There is con- some concern about you know canola being in flower and some of the heat that has been seen this week across Western Canada, but. I don't, w- wouldn't say any sort of panic is setting in yet. It's just it's some, some conditions that are less than ideal. But uh, we've been waiting for some of the heat, and it, it turned on. And it has definitely turned on this week. It's been a beautiful week at Ag in Motion out there just outside of Saskatoon. If you uh, have any feedback on any issue, maybe maybe it pertains to what you saw at Ag in Motion. Maybe it's another issue that's bothering you. Uh, you got some feedback, some thoughts, some commentary. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find Real Agriculture across all the different social media platforms, or you can call the Real Ag Feedback line, 855-776-6147. Let's start off this week's Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada in Coburg, Ontario, and we're talking to Mark Burnham. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good, how are you, Sean? Hey, man, I'm doing pretty good. What's happening this week on the farm? Oh, we're in a mad dash to uh, get our machinery ready for wheat harvest. Yeah, and so what are some of the, what, what does that look like? <laughs> well, the combine's torn apart in the shop. Uh, we've got truck getting a service done. We're switching one tractor from skinny tires back over to fat tires to put back on the buggy. 
So yeah, a bit of a mad dash. And, I don't know, I think wheat's going to be ready to go here either Friday or Saturday. So we'll see how she goes. What are those yields projected to be? What are you thinking? Uh, not as good as last year. Um, last year we had a record yield. Um, but I think we are going to be well above our um, insurance averages. So okay, shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, hurting anything. Okay, what, what's the weather been like there lately? Uh, well, yesterday we had uh, those big thunderstorms roll through. Uh, we got anywhere from an inch and three quarters to two and a quarter inches of rain. Um, and but yeah, it's been hot and sticky. Aside from that, so <laughs> yeah. A little bit of everything. What, what are your What are your thoughts on the corn and beans? Uh, around here, they look excellent. Um, there's been a few pockets, like we're in a we're in a pocket where we never got too wet, too dry. Um, so our crops look very good, um, but it doesn't like you drive 45 minutes in almost any direction, and you can find some pockets of uh, poorer crops. That variability, yeah, 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 and then that, that whenever you have that kind of variability, it it really makes you question, like, well, how much yield is really here, right? Because it's it's hard sometimes to figure, like, when, if it's a tabletop and it all looks the same, you can kind of figure it out. But I find the more variability you have, it, and it depends on the crop type too a little bit. Um, but it it can really add some uh, some doubt in your mind and lack of assurances in terms of what that actual yield will end up being. And sometimes it surprises you, and sometimes it eh, disappoints you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, you're, you're talking about getting the the combine stuff ready for 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 harvest. Is it? Do you typically do it this time of the year, right before harvest? Uh, how come not in the winter? Uh, well. Usually, I'm trying to get it done a little earlier than right now, but uh, 2024, we've always, uh, it seems to be a year of just playing catch up. Um, we, our harvest got uh, delayed last fall, um, and we didn't really get finished till, I can't remember, sometime in February, I think it was. Um, so we were just kind of late getting that done, and then our winter projects got delayed so they got pushed into early spring projects and everything has just been pushed back and pushed back so we're just always trying to climb the stairs and stay ahead of everything so yeah do you, do you have any land right on like Coburg is right on Lake Ontario there yep. do, do you have any land that's right up against the lake uh, we've got stuff within a few hundred meters, but there's like a swamp in between, so you can't really see the lake from those fields. But, uh, yeah, we, we, we've got quite a bit of land base where you can see the lake, so it's yeah. quite nice. Get that wintertime, get that big snow lake effect? Uh, we're south of the snow belt, or what we call the snow belt. Um, so if we get a snow... It usually hangs around four or five days, and then it melts and gone. Uh, and it's, okay, that's slushy mess again. So, <laughs> I I hear you. The uh, curious as to how you've been handling and dealing with some of these uh, markets. You know, what I continue to hear from farmers is lots of concern about those the markets kind of deteriorating in value continually here over the past number of months. Have you been able to manage some of your risk? Yeah, a good portion of my wheat's uh, pre-sold at a reasonable price. Um, I missed the highs, but I so far I've missed the lows. Um, and uh, I don't really grow many soybeans, so it's all edible beans, so it's all contracted. So I'm not too concerned about the bean market. But, yeah, corn, it's going to hurt a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do, you, um, do you have any I, 23 corn still around? I do. Oh, that oh, okay, that hurt, that that does hurt. Yeah. You know, I got uh. a couple couple hundred uh probably 400 ton of old crop corn unsold, so it's yeah. It's, that's a bit of an oopsie. You we can make up something like you forgot about it. <laughs> Would that make you feel better? Well, it it was a bit of a like I've got a contract uh, non-GMO 
corn contract yeah. uh, for most of it, and we were just unsure how much um, that would eat out of the bins. And yeah, it turns out we still have an entire bin that's unsold. So that that's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Oh shoot! You, you're gonna you're just gonna have to kind of plug your nose and move yeah. it, I guess, at some point. Well, like I said, it's a bit of an extra crop anyway, so it's uh, better than kicking the pants. On, on those edible beans, you mentioned that you don't have to you know, manage it like, say, you would if it was just commodity soybeans. Uh, how do those contracts work? Do you get an opportunity to lock in at certain times, or is the price just set by the buyer? How does that work? Uh, yeah, so it's just set by the buyer when you agree to grow them. Um, it's... Uh, like we, we grow azuki beans, and I think it's you, you get a set price on 1,500 pounds, 1500 pounds or 1,800 pounds per acre. Um, and then I think over that is subject to an overage price, and that is usually set uh, later in harvest. Like usually we're almost done by the time we hear what the overage is. Um, so it can either go up or down depending on the year and the demand for it. So Do, do you find at the end of the day, the edible beans are uh, just a, you know, weed control is a concern, but if you can manage that, <laughs> it, it's it's better to the bottom line than, say, growing commodity beans in your area? Yes. Yeah. Um, it has been very profitable for us, but it is also a very high management crop. Um, yeah, like I am going, well, I'm going to do four herbicide passes, I think, by the time I'm done on some of them, and then possibly two fungicide passes, and I'm starting to throw foliar fertilizers in every pass while I'm out there. And yeah, it's, it's a lot. And yeah, we have uh, perennial weeds that are out there now, like sow thistle that are just a nightmare to deal with. Do but, you, uh, that's do you, all, that's also part of our non GMO issue too, which yeah. we're probably resolving next year <laughs> by stopping the non GMO corn. Uh, how'd you get into non GMO corn? Uh, we've got a local end user, um, uh, ingredient uh, that uses that and we were, we were in the program but uh, we were always on the bubble on, like we're the last ones in so we're the first ones to get kicked out if they've got a low demand for it and uh, we got kicked out this year even though I planted it all in non-GMO corn but uh, it doesn't look like it's going to happen next year so and with the ma- with management I'm just tired of fighting South Thistle so probably go back to GMO corn so I can spray Roundup and kill the stuff. Yeah, well, again, weed management would be the biggest difference, right? That's th- That would be yeah. a huge challenge to overcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. we're not really concerned about the BT trait because um, we've got a decent crop rotation. Um, so, yeah, it's just all about yeah, the herbicide uh, use hmm. for us, so... Well, hey, Mark, good luck with Harvest. Get, you know, I, I, I don't want to keep you and uh, keep you away from getting <laughs> that machine already because <laughs> when it's go time, it's go time. So, hey, thanks a lot for joining us here this week on the Farmer Rapid Fire. All right, thank, thank you, Sean. Hey, we'll be right back here on Real Ag Radio, Farmer Rapid Fire today, of course, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Can. Talking right now to Azotics Global Business Development Manager, Tom Tricano. Let's talk about what exactly does Invita do. So what Invita can do, it can be applied with your herbicide, your fungicides. It gets inside the plant cells, and that's where it fixes nitrogen. So really, we're talking about an alternative form of nitrogen that can fix nitrogen into a usable form right inside the plant cells. You can either use it in furrow, or it can be a foliar-applied product. What can farmers expect from Invita when they're using it? Obviously, that depends on the crop you're growing and what your fertility rates are. The vast majority of the folks using it are comparing it at 100% of their fertility. So they're not changing their nitrogen down. The growers are going to use this that's going to provide them the best ROI. The vast majority of the time we're looking at this as, as standard fertility rates. Sometimes you're going to lose some nitrogen. I expect Invita to show a stronger benefit than it typically does, simply because the applied nitrogen would have been lost. If somebody wants more information on Invita, the website azotic.com, or of course, you can always talk to your local retailer to source the product. The Pulse School on realagriculture.com has everything you need to get your crop off to a great start and a strong finish. Whether you're growing chickpeas, fava beans, lentils, or peas, you'll get all the latest and best agronomic information at pulseschool.com. 
a library of top-notch agronomy videos from industry experts available on demand at your fingertips. Visit the Pulse School, brought to you by BASF on realagriculture.com. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio, here for the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by... Pioneer Seeds Canada, and we're gonna well, we're gonna leap back to Atlantic Canada. We're gonna be in Prince Edward Island, and we're in Kensington to be specific. And we're talking to Ryan Barrett. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Hi, Sean. How are you? Hey, man, I'm doing pretty good. Well, uh, I hear you're out in a potato field, which is something that uh, I'd be surprised if you weren't at this time of the year. How are crops looking? <laughs> uh, tremendous, actually. Um, I don't think uh, the crops look this good this early in July in a long time. Um, so most of the islands had sufficient rainfall, and we actually got some people got another inch to an inch and a half last night and surprised thunderstorms, but not everybody got the same amount. But um, yeah, it's uh, we haven't really been suffering too much in the way of moisture deficit. It has been warm here the last couple of weeks, but uh, supposed to cool down a little bit over the weekend and be a little bit more tolerable for everybody, including potatoes um, yeah. Yeah, and cows well, I, and everybody else. I was curious, what, what kind of weather are you cheering for right now for potatoes? Well, potatoes like probably up to about 25, and then it gets much more than 25, and then they start suffering a little bit, and it gets above 30, and then they start to kind of shut down. So... We try, you know, you can't control the weather by any means, but uh, you prefer, you know, mid, mid-20s mid is good. Um, and then we start getting a lot of back-to-back high 30s, or sorry, high 20s or low 30s. It, it can uh, slow them down a little bit, especially if you don't have irrigation to cool them off. Um, so, but uh, if, you're, if you're in a place where you get higher temperatures and you have access to irrigation, then you can get keep them cooler with evaporative cooling. It's not quite as bad. You know, we had a potato farmer from uh, Alberta on the show last week, and, you know, he pointed out one of the biggest differences on his farm between being, you know, an air quotes, regular farmer and a potato grower is you're in those fields every day. They, they, they take some intense management, observation, and decision-making continually. What, why, what, why is that about potatoes? Well, pretty high-value crop. Uh, and they're a high-value crop that's prone to a lot of diseases or insects or pests, and so you're trying to keep a pretty close eye on them to make sure that you're keeping on top of those things and you're spraying when needed and uh, you're managing accordingly. And then also if you're having to manage for irrigation, then you're also you're in moisture testing and that sort of thing, trying to make sure you're you know, timing your irrigations at the right time. And then... Out in Alberta or Manitoba, a lot of guys put nitrogen on with the irrigation, right? So then they're, again, they're trying to spoon feed the crop uh, through the year. Here in PEI, the guys that do irrigate, not so much uh, uh, fertigation through the irrigation. So that's a little, makes things a little bit less complex. But this time of year, we're out walking fields on a, you know, at least once a week, uh, just keeping an eye on insect pressure, uh, keeping an eye out for any diseases. Um, right now we're worried about things like, uh, early blight and brown spot and white mold, uh, a few other fungal diseases. We do, we do some, uh, spore trapping for that, uh, across the island, trying to keep an eye on it that way. Um, but, uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, yeah, looking for insect damage, Colorado potato beetles and some of the other, uh, critters that can cause damage to the crop. And then... As we get a little further on, just, you know, pulling a few plants and seeing if that they're sizing up and making sure we don't have any deficiencies in any nutrients or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they, they take some monitoring. I wouldn't say we're in here every day, but we're in here at least till, you're usually in each field at least once a week. It's interesting. You'll, you'll appreciate this story. Last week I met the Calgary Stampede at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Reception, okay? And so Minister McCauley is there, who, of course, is from Prince Edward Island. And uh, he gives his welcome address, his speech, talks about, uh, you know, agriculture across the country. And he does point out you know, seafood and potatoes in, uh, in Atlantic Canada. Then uh, R.J. Siegertson, who's the Alberta Minister of Agriculture, gets up and he says, you know, Alberta, the largest amount of potato acres in the country. And 
all of a sudden Macaulay starts to boo from the front row. It was a very, very <laughs> funny, lighthearted moment. I, I quite enjoyed it. It was pretty good. So I, I knew you would you would uh, appreciate that. We have, we have Some people don't know this, but we have potatoes, I think, in every province in the country. Is that correct? It's pretty close. Pretty much. Uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland would have, I would say, fairly low numbers, like less than a thousand acres, like, you know, kind of non-commercial. But the other provinces largely all have a significant potato industry and very different from province to province. You know, like Alberta is very heavily focused on um, processing. So they have, you know, four or five major processors. Ontario and Ontario is very focused on potato chips. Uh, Quebec's very focused on fresh potatoes. PEI is one of the few provinces where we kind of do a little bit of everything. So we, you know, we have a significant fresh industry. We have a significant processing industry. We have a significant seed industry. So uh, not, it isn't the same in every province, meaning isn't the same, you know, growing window isn't the same varieties, but you know, lots in common, but also little differences here and there for sure. Yeah. Hey, how are things on the family dairy farm? Oh, things are good. Um, we're uh, working on second cut here at the moment. We're a little later on second cut. Which we're putting up another uh, bunker silo for some uh, chopped silage. But uh, yeah, we're getting, we're we're making a good stab at the second cut, and things really, really big crop of first cut, and I'd say a fairly strong crop of second cut as well. It's been a good good hay year so far too. Uh, the grains looking good. Um, last year we had a lot of Fusarium head blight uh, in a lot of uh, in a lot of grain around the province. So a lot of people, I think, wisely learned lessons and have been more proactive with getting sprays on <laughs> fungicides on this year. So I'd say early reports are that the grain crop's looking really good. Um, the corn's coming fast. Um, everything's just growing like gangbusters and uh, and all the crops. So I'd say you know depending on how the rest of the season works out, uh, where it should be on on track for a good crop on multiple uh multiple commodities and multiple uh different farms so so far so good that that's encouraging doesn't it feel good when you got an opportunity out in the field like we we, we gotta get we gotta harvest it yet i realize that i don't want to get too far ahead of myself but yeah it's it's yeah, no no jinxes but uh but yeah so far so good so far uh like we were dry to begin but they you know there's always been, you know, those old edges go around, planned into dust, and the bins will bust. I don't know if that's true or not. I think I heard, might have heard, uh, we eat say it once or twice, yeah. and maybe in chest as much as anything. But it it was dry here, and it meant for uh, like everybody could get in early, and almost everything got planted ahead of schedule, and then we got sufficient rain, and we've had rain about every seven to ten days since. So um, that's a recipe for success on a lot of crops. And yeah. I'd say most stuff here is seven to 10 days ahead of schedule. So like we had uh, wheat, winter wheat starting to turn, uh, turn yellow here, you know, the first week of July, which is unheard of for BEI. So, um, you know, we're definitely on track for early harvest on, on some of the grains for sure. Well, I think planted to dust and the bins will bust is, it, it it comes through much more than rain ninety days after a fog. I I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> I, I I'm fairly certain there's math to prove it. Hey Ryan, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Farm Rapid Fire. Really appreciate it. No problem anytime. Hey, we'll be right back on the Farm Rapid Fire. Brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. Advanced canola trait technology is here. And it's soon to be the talk of the town. Optimum Gly delivers excellent yield potential and agronomic trait performance. Improved crop safety. Enhanced weed control. And a wider window of application. You're going to want to see this. Learn more at OptimumGly.ca. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. 
Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here for the Farmer Rapid Fire. We're going to stop in Manitoba in Wawanisa, and we're talking to Jeff Elder. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? It's going good, Sean. How are you? Pretty good. Hey, how are those crops looking? Um, they're making uh, making headway here. Uh, we had a lot of excess moisture this spring. Uh, seeding kind of got delayed a few times. Um, cereals have mostly looked good from the start lots of drowned out areas in them and um, now that we finally have some heat the uh, corn and soybeans are are gaining some traction and and starting to see them grow well i would imagine in manitoba lots of water now heat the mosquitoes have got to be awful you know we were talking about that a couple times in the last week, and they are not as bad as we thought they might be. They're How? still bad. I, I don't know. I think the wood ticks are eating them because everybody says the wood ticks are insane. Oh, interesting. Uh, I, I don't know. There's probably no correlation there, but but uh, no, the consensus to the people I talked to was mosquitoes are bad, but not as bad as they should be considering there's water laying everywhere. Yeah. But well, the, uh, yeah, wood ticks are crazy. Well, for all the uh, backyard entomologist enthusiasts out there, if anybody knows whether <laughs> wood ticks <laughs> impact mosquito populations, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. There we go. We'll get, some, we'll get some answers, Jeff. We'll get some answers. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sure you will. Yeah. Hey, so yield potential. Now, like you said, the temperature's been turned up. We've, uh, you know, like I was at Ag in Motion earlier this week. It was above 30. Beautiful weather. Um, yep. Yeah, during canola flowering, though. That's not, you know, yeah. not the best timing, but what do you think? Well, I was at Ag in Motion yesterday as well, and it was hot there. Um, it's not the best, but the crop. Crops have moisture. Maybe that'll help them hold it off. Here today, I'm back. At, I'm back at home. Uh, it's 21 degrees out. It's beautiful. Mm. Um, but we are we are headed for the very high 20s, maybe 30 in the next few days again. And I'm I'm hopeful it won't be too bad. You know, we're not we're not going to see like into the into the mid 30s or anything like that, according to the forecast. So I'm I'm hopeful with you know. Some some good moisture and and the, and the canola. I didn't mention canola earlier. Uh, it's pretty variable depending on how well drained the fields were, but a lot of it's in full flower now yeah. and and growing out of that excess moisture. So I think it'll be okay. I, I try to be optimistic. Do you, do you have tile on your ground? Uh, yeah, we did. That's uh, a very small project two years ago and kind of a larger project last fall. And yeah, it's obvious that that is a huge difference maker in a year like this. Yeah. Uh, uh, how long does it, like you put tile in for on your farm. What, how, what's the payback? Like how quickly, like, I guess it depends how much it rains. Well, it depends how much it rains. Uh, the more it rains, the quicker uh, any salinity is, is, filtered out of the soil um takes a certain amount of rainfall to do that if that is your issue if your issue is just excess moisture and a high water table um you know that's going to pay back most years but it'll pay back really big in a year like this where we've had more than 15 inches of rain uh since april yeah. Well, hey, any any equipment issues this year? Has everything been running really well? I don't want to talk about that, Sean, because oh, everything why? has been working fine. Oh. Everything's been working fine. Oh, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> we're we're yeah. we're like we're doing the jinx there. It's sort of like when people say, "Yeah, I got a great crop out there. Yields are going to be fantastic." They're you know they're they're crossing their fingers. I'm sorry to do that on equipment. I didn't know that. I didn't know the same rules applied. <laughs> well, I'm not sure they do, but I'm not going to. I don't want to take a chance. That's smart, very smart on your part. <laughs> um, hey, anything stick out to you at Egg in Motion? Um, there was so much to see. Just the sheer vastness of this, of the different things that were there to see, the people to talk to. I, you know, one day is not enough. Um, but we, yeah, we drove up. Monday night, and we're there the full day and drove home last night, got to home two in the morning, and, you know, really, a person should spend two days there, and, and there's just so much to see. Yeah, that's a long day for you. Like, you didn't get home till two in the morning, man. You, you... It's a long day for our driver. We took a we took a little bus with 15 of us. <laughs> oh, that, oh, wow, that doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> no. No, Might, maybe a bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it was. I found it interesting in the sense that uh, we're still, you know, I think pushing equipment larger, right? There's still like there, there's things for yeah. all shapes and sizes, but we we clearly have not scaled out yet in terms of size, air carts, uh, tender wagons, <laughs> sprayer widths. It's, it's bigger. Bigger all the time. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, as we see drones trying to gain traction and robotic stuff, smaller as well. Yeah. But, like, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not a big farmer. Um, I don't need 80, you know, 80 foot drill with, uh, you know, 1,100 bushels towed around my field. But, so for me, I didn't spend a lot of time looking at the equipment because I, I know by the time it's traded off three or four times, uh, I'm probably going to be retired. So um, I I always pay more attention to, you know, seed and chemistry and, and uh, you know, some of the smaller incremental improvements I can maybe, I can maybe eke out. Yeah, but, but even, okay, so your, your farm's medium size, as you described. At, yeah. At, is there any price point where some of these large combines, like the, you know, the X9 or the CR11, they make sense for you? Not today, no. Right. The, the, but, you know, I mean, a, the, yeah. There's a price point if they sell it like they sell a ten year old used combine. Then yeah, I guess that I could get into that. But mm. no, like that just doesn't pencil out. Well, that's what on, I've always been. That's the, what, yeah, that's what I've always been interested in. Is like, what? And I, and I talked to Machinery Pete about this. Going back to oh, him and I last chatted, probably like in January or February. You know, it's it's okay. Who's the second owner of that size of equipment? And you know, he made the point. He's like, forget about the second owner. Who's the third owner? And what does that yeah. market look like? And who is that market? Because. It, 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 I think it's kind of unanswered because we're so new into some of the largest of scale of stuff. So it, it's it's kind of fascinating in terms of how a market develops. So, yeah, some uh, any anything. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I was just like going to give you an example. Like I have a forty foot drill. It's really hard to find a good used, newer style forty foot drill. Right. They just people people don't buy them like they do. The bigger drills, when they buy three of them, you know, the, on the bigger farms. And so good used, medium-sized equipment, it can be it can be real scarce. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Well, hey, Jeff, all the best to you during harvest. And uh, looking Thank forward you. to chatting with you a bit later on in the fall, okay? That'd be great, Sean. Awesome stuff. Great to hear those crops are looking good out there in Wawanisa. Hey, we'll be right back here on Real Ag Radio, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. I get to spend every day talking to farmers in the ag industry through realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. But nothing is more fun than speaking to an audience live and in person. If you're planning an ag event, book a Real Agriculture speaker to make it a successful and memorable experience. 
email shaney at realagriculture.com and you can book myself or any other real ag personality to speak at your event. Bring your audience all the fun, insight, and energy of real agriculture. It's summertime, and you've got a lot of important decisions to make when it comes to your corn crop. Let the Corn School on realagriculture.com help guide you through those big decisions with input from leading experts in the field. If it's spray timing, disease identification, or any other field issue, the Corn School's got you covered. The Corn School on realagriculture.com, brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. And we take the Farmer Rapid Fire, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada, to Bigger Saskatchewan, and we're talking to Colin DeMozak. Hey, Colin, how's it going? Hey, Sean, pretty good, and yourself? Pretty good. Okay, first time, right? You're a rookie to yeah. the Farmer Rapid Fire. I am. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, so tell me about your farm. Uh, we're in a mid-sized farm uh, just west of Bigger here, and uh, we grow mustard and canola and wheat and peas and lentils. Nice, and and we happened to meet each other on uh, Tuesday at the uh, Egg in Motion show, and it was great to meet you in person. That was awesome. Um, how did you enjoy Egg in Motion? It was uh, it was a good show. Um, lots to see, and you know, run into lots of people you see every day, and have uh, lots of visits, so you don't get too far. But uh, just recovering from heat stroke today, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little hot. Yeah, you had to, it was a good thing there was lots of water around. Uh, that, I know that really saved me as I was walking the grounds, for for sure. Did you did you see any equipment or anything that kind of caught your eye a little bit? Um, well, I try and check out the drones every year just to see where we're at. I'm interested in getting into that once we're legal. And um, checking out the new pillar tank was uh, interesting. And um, yeah, just lots of lots of stuff to see for sure. It's, there's no end of new equipment every year. Yeah, some of the, some of the plots were touched by some hail a little bit early on in the season. You could see that in some of the plots as you went from seed company to seed company. But overall, uh, it seems like it'd be a, a pretty successful show. And sunshine's always better than uh, pouring rain, which is what we got last year on one of the days. So that's yeah, right. yeah, I Talking remember around the mud. Every, every time I see Christian Hebert, he still has to remind me that he le- had to lend me a hoodie or a bunny hug, as they say in Saskatchewan, <laughs> because I was frozen and underdressed in a sideways <laughs> rain. So uh, he still brings it up all the time. So. Yeah, welcome yeah. to Saskatchewan. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so how do those crops look? Crops are looking good. Um, I, I can't complain. We've had more rain this year than we've had in uh, the last three years combined. So we're coming out of drought and... Feeling good about things. So you've had more rain this year than the last three years combined. Those crops are going to yeah. look a lot different than they have in the past. A lot different. We're we're gearing up for a, an actual harvest this year, so we're pretty excited. <laughs> like like the combines actually, you're, you're actually going to be able to fill the combine and run it at capacity. Yeah, yeah run it at capacity, and you know. It's, stuff coming out the back and instead of just going over the motions to clean stuff up and you know get ready for next year so i'm i'm excited to see some some green coming in we're uh, we're doing some dirt work right now trying to get some new bins up this year and uh you know ordering grain bags <laughs> and ready wow you you okay you got some yield out in the field that's good okay so um i i i, I guess if I think back to a lot of the conversations I've had with Western Canadian farmers and I say, which crop looks the best, a high majority of them have said the cereals. Is that the case on your farm? It is, yeah. The uh, the cereals look great. The mustard looks really good too. The canola is just kind of lagging behind. We had a pretty cool spring and lots of moisture and I think it... Uh, I think some of the nutrients got washed down away from it before it could get to it, so mm. it's, uh, it's lagging behind for sure. How, how long have you been growing mustard? Uh, I've been growing mustard for four years myself. We've had mustard on this farm for a long time. Yeah. No. And and some people outside of the region are going to be like, well, wait a minute, mustard, why not grow canola? What's the answer to that question? Well, uh, this year I did a... 
bit of a trial. We did uh, about a thousand acres of mustard on direct seeded grass. It's been in grass for about 15 years, and uh, it was the less risky option for me to put in, and it proved to be the right option. I think it took off. It's got better vigor than canola in some cases. So, but uh, you know, not always do I want to grow mustard, and sometimes we don't. But I have land that we haven't put canola on yet, so that was the right answer. And, and mustard tends to do a little bit better in more drought conditions too, right? Yes, it uh, it certainly can pull through better than canola, for sure. It's been the case over the last three years. <laughs> I remember as a kid, and uh, my uh, grandfather on my mom's side had rented out his land to a neighbor. And I remember, and, and my grandfather, it was, he had, it was basically Durham summer follow. Okay, that's all he did in dry land, okay, at the time. And uh, yeah. I remember the neighbor started growing mustard, and this was quite controversial, according to my grandfather. <laughs> and uh, I remember we went out there, and it was terrible drought, and there was, it was a pretty sparse-looking mustard field. And I, re- I remember my grandfather saying, you know, I'll just say the guy's name was, let's just make up a name, Joe. He says, Joe? So I look at this field of mustard. I don't think you got enough mustard here to put it on a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Not very funny. Like that's like kicking somebody when they're down uh, yep. in the middle of a drought. But uh, I'm sure you can identify with those kind of conditions the past number of years. I, I, I sure can. I sure can. As far as the last couple of years, uh, even in 22, we had some of a crop coming, and we got 100 percent hailed out. So. Yeah, just uh, year after year, it's been nice to see the crops come in this year, and I, I'm hoping we can take it all the way to the finish line. So Yeah, yeah. So w- w- based on that finish line, w- when do you kind of typically uh, get going with harvest? What does it look like? Well, normally we would start, you know, maybe August 18th instead of July 29th, but <laughs> this year it should be around the 18th, I'm thinking. Yeah, okay, okay. And uh, how about on the crop marketing side? What what does that look like? Uh, you have some expectations of yield, so you've got some marketing to do. How do you typically handle your marketing, and, and how have you managed it this year? Well, again, that's been very wild over the last couple of years, I guess. But um, this year we're a little bit, but we're still pretty gun-shy from, you know, 2021 is still in my mind, so we're... yeah. You know, I was hesitant, I was hesitant to sell, you know, too much off the combine. You know, looking back, always in hindsight, twenty twenty, it'd be better to sell a lot more nine dollar wheat, I guess, than seven dollar wheat. But um, you know, we're not there yet either. So let's see what harvest brings and and get uh, get the contracts we have in sold and moved off the field and go from there. Yeah, it's been pretty tough to watch some of these prices drop like they have, right? Yes, it has, big time. Yeah. You don't have any 23 crop around, do you? I am very sparse on 23 crop. We've got most of it gone, so That's maybe positive. a bit or two. Here. Yeah, it's, it's, it is good. Might have been better to sell it all off the combine last year, but, uh, you know, again, everybody else is switching the same thing. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, earlier this week I was on uh, RFD TV on the Market Day Report, and I was talking about the potential of a, of a rail strike. And, and not just any rail strike in Canada. We're talking about a rail strike that potentially happened here in August, which would be with both rails, CN and CP. If that does yeah, happen, that, how does that impact someone like you? Uh, that would impact all of us, I think. Um, I'm kind of thinking that it won't you know, turn into too much because I think government will mandate them back to work. And I have a couple of buddies that work the rail line, and they say... You know, within three days, we're going to be back to work type thing. They've never had a prolonged strike. So I, I'm hoping that he's right and we don't have something nasty. But that would really put a bump in the in the road for us for getting green to the market for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, tell, you tell your buddies to uh, settle. Okay, if you, you got you got you got a bit of inside track there. <laughs> Tell them to settle. Yeah, no, I, I I feel for them because I really do think they do need this. At the same time, it's kind of imperative that we keep those rails going. So yeah, it's kind of a slippery slope, I guess. But um, I, hope, I hope that they just stay at work and keep the grain moving and and get it to, get it to market here. Because if, if they don't, it's going to be ugly. I hear you. Well, hey. 
Colin, really appreciate you joining us for your first ever Farmer Rapid Fire. We're definitely going to have you uh, back on. I want to get an update on how this crop came into the bin and out of the field. So we'll check in with you a bit later on in the year, okay? Right on. Thanks a lot, Sean. Hey, awesome stuff. I love having new people on the Farmer Rapid Fire. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We've got more coming up here on Real Ag Radio, brought to you today by Pioneer Seeds Canada. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Infuse some energy into your next corporate event, customer meeting, or conference with Real Ag Radio, Canada's national agriculture radio show. Create a unique experience at your next event with host Sean Haney, broadcasting Real Ag Radio live on Sirius XM, featuring exciting guests, captivating interviews, and the latest news from the agriculture community. Contact advertising at realagriculture.com or call 587 787 1795 to book your on location with Real Ag Radio today. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio for the Farmer Rapid Fire brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. And right now we're joined by Chris Allback, who, of course, is a Pioneer Seeds agronomist in Ontario. Hey, Chris, how's it going? It's going pretty good today, Sean. Hey, whereabouts in Ontario are you based? Where's your territory? Yeah, so I kind of cover uh, St. Thomas to Niagara. Uh, most most recently, um, I've taken on a new job that's covering Western Ontario as the product agronomist. So I'm pretty excited about that. But today we're just in Woodstock. That's where I'm at today. I'm at the uh, agronomy hub we have across the street from the research station. Um, and I had an opportunity just to have uh, some of our sales reps from that geography that I I service uh, together with some research people today. So that's where I'm coming from today. We just cool. finished up, and uh, it's pretty busy here at the station. So what did you learn? Yeah, uh, we we had a bit of it. It's part of one of my favorite parts of the job is just uh, getting together with the research staff that are here, the corn breeders, the soybean breeders, and uh, and having them uh, just share thoughts across uh, across the table from our sales reps. Right, um, uh, great opportunity for that. So you obviously learn a lot. Um, we covered our Z series lineup, our uh, our corn offering here in in uh, this part of Ontario. And uh, just the opportunity for lots of questions, which was really good. Um, well, there's a lot of kids in and out of here today. Summer students, they're all uh, pollination starting. So they're they're busy with that, which was great. So a lot of people uh, in and out of the station today, which I just love to see that. It's really fun. So. Yeah, that that is cool. It, it always is. Even if you're in, you know, agronomic extension or you're in sales, it's always nice to be able to talk to some of the researchers. Right. Like it's, you yeah. know, connecting some of oh, those yeah. dots. It's, it's great to get feedback. You can ask questions. Um, and, I, and I know they like it, too, because it challenges them from a commercialization side of it to to think differently as well than just with their research brain. It's oh, cool. yeah, for sure. So uh, lots of opportunities for that today. Yeah. Yeah. So for those people that are watching this on on video, you've got some pretty good looking corn behind you there. Yeah. Yeah. Things are usually. uh Pretty good at this uh, this site, although this was planted uh, on the later side. Um, crops kind of all over the map in my geography. I got, you know, 3,300 heat unit corn down by the lake that's starting to silk, right, 1136. And then they got some of, you know, some of the hybrids you see behind me uh, planted into the first part of May that are flowering. And then I've got some corn that's, you know, May 24 looking pretty rough, you know, to say the mm-hmm. least. Uh, but coming together, you know, like, you know, some of it looks pretty pretty good too and it, it'll be a bit to till it's flowering but uh yeah it kind of snuck up on us here so um i'm just having a look at some of these as we wrapped up the meeting and uh taking a look at where we're at not quite flowering here but certainly looking pretty good in uh in tavistock woodstock area here yeah and, and right now for that corn you, you're you're looking for heat right like is is that, yeah. is that what the crop is, is what, what, what what kind of weather are you cheering for right now i guess is the best way to put it <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe drier weather, I should say, uh, for a lot of our customers, um, just a lot of lot going on. I think for the corn crop, um, you know, it offers uh, some benefits for sure. Corn's transpiring a lot of water, using a lot of water. And uh, from, from what I can tell, it's growing pretty good. 
uh, you know, in, in a lot of parts of the province due to the, due to the wads received, if it's getting too much, uh, it can be, can be challenging. And of course, like barrel, you know, is hurricane barrels dropping, uh, a, a fair amount of uh, moisture on us, but also probably some other, other challenges. Right. So I think things change your mindset changes. I think we're going to start spraying as soon as the ground will carry here, um, for things like tar spot. I found a couple fields of it, uh, a little earlier than I was expecting outside of areas that I usually would see it. So that's of course, uh, something to keep on, on track. It's not, not a huge alarm yet to me, uh, cause we will get on and get start, start, start spraying as soon as the, the ground dries up, but, uh, definitely on the radar. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I, we're, we're wanting heat. <laughs> I guess tar, tar spot it, is the one I've been hearing more <laughs> right. and more from people concerned, but this could be a year where tar spot could provide some of those negative impacts we've been talking about for the past three years. Right. So you got to be on the lookout. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that, that stands in any year. I mean, uh, it's just comes, comes about the time you start talking about it, but I think, um, we need to, we need to think about, you know, what, what hybrids we have out there, you know, the disease package we offer, get offered through that, um, timing and, uh, what, what your fungicides can and can't do for you. Um, a lot of opportunities to manage the crop there. Um, and yeah, I think, a lot of farmers are thinking about it, having conversations, which is really good to see. Um, yeah, just just paying attention to it, I think, is the most important thing because um, yeah. there's a lot to think about. So, yeah, that's yeah. what's going on in the corn crop today, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, absolutely. What are some before we wrap up here? Main questions you're getting from growers right now? Things are top of mind for for them. Is there anything agronomically that's sticking out that they're uh, repeatedly asking you that we should address? Yeah, uh, just. Just tracking that disease, I think was a big one. We just covered that, but um, a lot of uh, farmers focused on starting to take in the wheat crop. Uh, I know a lot got going, but there's still a lot to do. Um, and the rain has has kind of complicated that in certain areas. Um, just just want to make sure uh, I've filled a lot of questions around the wheat quality and that kind of thing, uh, which I think is fairly uh, good so far. But when you get these rewetting cycles, right, uh, it can start to deteriorate quick um, in certain areas, you know, are uh, are looking at that um you know more that's more a pressing issue for them i'd say yeah. than others um but yeah we're trying to get the crop off there uh been handling a lot of questions on that uh as far as soybeans goes you know uh my haldeman niagara region has been has been uh i would say blessed with a, a pretty good spring insofar as the the years provided them a lot of crops up and out of the ground um, but just walking those crops, you know, you start to see they've gotten a lot of water now too, and um, the crop is up, and that's a good chunk of the battle. But uh, other diseases and pathogens coming in, uh, you know, and that on my whole area, probably fungicide timing for soybeans, you know, uh, is, is another big one we've handling a lot of questions on. So working a lot with my reps on that uh, timing, you know, discussions around uh, what products to use and where to use them and how to use them, and and those things, a lot of fun discussions come out of that in terms of how we're going to push the crop into into the harvest year I, yeah so i want to thank you for the time there sean it's been good to talk to you and i just want to wish all the farmers listening today just a good time as uh as they finish up wheat harvest in ontario and maybe other parts of the world as they uh try and make a crop out of the season just uh want to wish you a safe time and a productive year yeah, well put. There's uh, there's a lot of work to be done to get this crop in the bin. And uh, I know one thing for sure, Chris, farmers are up to the task. So, hey, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Farmer Rapid Fire. All right. Take care. Awesome stuff. That is Chris Allback. He is out of uh, around Tavistock, Woodstock, uh, St. Thomas area in Ontario. Okay, if you have any feedback on today's show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also call the Relag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Big thanks to Pioneer Seeds Canada for being the exclusive sponsor of the Farmer Rapid Fire. Thank you for getting real and getting connected with Relag Radio, and we'll chat again, of course, tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.